The Big Bounce by Walter S. Tevis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Seeing it in action, anybody would quaver in alarm. What hath Farnsworth overwrought? The Big Bounce by Walter S. Tevis. Let me show you something, Farnsworth said. He set his near-empty glass, a Bacardi martini, on the mantel and waddled out of the room toward the basement. I sat in my big leather chair, feeling very peaceful with the world, watching the fire. Whatever Farnsworth would have to show tonight would be far more entertaining than watching TV, my custom on these evenings. Farnsworth with his four labs in the house and his very tricky mind, never failed to provide my best night of the week. When he returned after a moment, he had with him a small box, about three inches square. He held this carefully in one hand, and stood by the fireplace dramatically, or as dramatically as a very small, very fat man with pink cheeks can stand by a fireplace of the sort that seems to demand a big man with tweeds pipe and perhaps a saber wound anyway he held the box dramatically and he said last week i was playing around in the chem lab trying to make a new kind of rubber eraser did quite well with the other drafting equipment you know especially the dimensional curve and the photosensitive ink well i approached the job by trying for a material that would absorb graphite without abrading the paper I was a little disappointed with this. It sounded pretty tame. But I said, How did it come out? He screwed his pudgy face up thoughtfully. Synthesized the material all right, and it seems to work. But the interesting thing is that it has a certain, um, secondary property that would make it quite awkward to use. Interesting property, though. Unique, I'm inclined to believe. This began to sound more like it. And what property is that? I poured myself a shot of straight rum from the bottle sitting on the table beside me. I did not like straight rum, but I preferred it to Farnsworth's rather imaginative cocktails. I'll show you, John, he said. He opened the box, and I could see that it was packed with some kind of batting. He fished in this and withdrew a gray ball about the size of a golf ball, and set the box on the mantel. "'And that's the eraser?' I asked. "'Yes,' he said. Then he squatted down, held the ball about an inch from the floor, dropped it. It bounced naturally enough. Then it bounced again, and again. Only this time was not natural, for on the second bounce the ball went higher in the air than on the first, and on the third bounce higher still. After half a minute my eyes were bugged out, and the little ball was bouncing four feet in the air, and going higher every time. I grabbed my glass. What the hell? I said. Farnsworth caught the ball in a pudgy hand and held it. He was smiling a little sheepishly. Interesting effect, isn't it? Now wait a minute, I said, beginning to think about it. What's the gimmick? What kind of motor do you have in that thing? His eyes were wide and a little hurt. No gimmick, John. None at all. Just a very peculiar molecular structure. Structure, I said. Bouncing balls just don't pick up energy out of nowhere. I don't care how their molecular structure is put together. And you don't get energy out without putting energy in. Oh, he said, that's the really interesting thing. Of course you're right. Energy does go into the ball. Here, I'll show you. He let the ball drop again, and it began bouncing, higher and higher, until it was hitting the ceiling. Barnesworth reached out to catch it, but he fumbled, and the thing glanced off his hand, hit the mantelpiece, and zipped across the room. It banged into the far wall, ricocheted, banked off three other walls, picking up speed all the time. When it whizzed by me like a rifle bullet, I began to get worried, but it hit against one of the heavy draperies by the window, and this damped its motion enough so that it fell to the floor. It started bouncing again immediately, but Farnsworth scrambled across the room and grabbed it. He was perspiring a little, 
and he began instantly to transfer the ball from one hand to another and back again, as if it were hot. Here, he said, and handed it to me. I almost dropped it. It's like a ball of ice, I said. Have you been keeping it in a refrigerator? No, as a matter of fact, it was at room temperature a few minutes ago. Now, wait a minute, I said. I only teach physics in high school, but I know better than that. Moving around in warm air doesn't make anything cold except by evaporation. Well, there's your input and output, John, he said. The ball lost heat and took on motion. Simple conversion. My jaw must have dropped to my waist. Do you mean that that little thing is converting heat to kinetic energy? Apparently. But that's impossible. He was beginning to smile thoughtfully. The ball was not as cold now as it had been, and I was holding it in my lap. A steam engine does it, he said. A steam turbine. Of course, they're not very efficient. They work mechanically, too, and only because water expands when it turns into steam. This seems to do it differently, he said, sipping thoughtfully at his dark brown martini. I don't know exactly how. Maybe something piezoelectric about the way its molecules slide about. I ran some tests and measured its impact energy in foot-pounds and compared that to the heat loss in BTUs. It seems to be about 98% efficient, as close as I can tell. Apparently, it converts heat into bounce very well. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting? I almost came flying out of my chair. My mind was beginning to spin like crazy. If you're not pulling my leg with this thing, Farnsworth, you've got something by the tail there that's just a little bit bigger than the discovery of fire. He blushed modestly. I'd rather thought that myself, he admitted. Good Lord, look at the heat that's available, I said, getting really excited now. Farnsworth was still smiling, very pleased with himself. I suppose you could put this thing in a box with conversion fins and let it bounce around inside. I'm way ahead of you, I said, but that won't work. All your kinetic energy would go right back to heat on impact, and eventually the little ball would build up enough speed to blast its way through any box you could build. Then how would you work it? Well, I said, choking down the rest of my rum, you'd seal the ball in a big steel cylinder, attach the cylinder to a crankshaft and flywheel, give the thing a shake to start the ball bouncing back and forth, and let it run like a gasoline engine or something. It would get all the heat it needed from the air in a normal room. Mount the apparatus in your house, and it would pump your water, operate a generator, and keep you cool at the same time. I sat down again, shakily, and began to pour myself another drink. Barnesworth had taken the ball from me, and it was carefully put back in its padded box. He was visibly showing excitement, too. I could see that his cheeks were ruddier and his eyes even brighter than normal. But what if you want the cooling, and don't want any work to be done? Simple, I said. You let the machine turn a flywheel, or lift weights and drop them, or something like that, outside your house. You have the air intake inside, and if, in the winter, you don't want to lose heat, you just mount the thing in an outside building, attach it to your generator, and use the power to do whatever you want. Heat your house, say. There's plenty of heat in outside air even in December. John, said Farnsworth, you are very ingenious. It might work. Of course it'll work. Pictures were beginning to light up in my head. And don't you realize that this is the answer to the solar power problem? Why, mirrors and selenium are, at best, 10% efficient. Think of a big pumping station on the Sahara. All that heat and all that need for power, for irrigation. I paused a moment for effect. Farnsworth, this could change the shape of the earth. Farnsworth seemed to be lost in thought. Finally, he looked at me strangely and said, Perhaps we had better try to build a model. I was so excited by the thing that I couldn't sleep that night. I kept dreaming of power stations, ocean liners, even automobiles being operated by balls bouncing back and forth in cylinders. I even worked out a spaceship in my mind a bullet-shaped affair with a huge rubber ball on its end, gyroscopes to keep it oriented properly, 
the ball serving as the solution to the biggest missile engineering problem, excess heat. You'd build a huge concrete launching field, supported all the way down to bedrock, hop in the ship and start bouncing. Of course, it would be kind of a rough ride. In the morning, I called my superintendent and told him to get a substitute for the rest of the week. I was going to be busy. Then I started working in the machine shop in Farnsworth's basement, trying to turn out a working model of a device that, by means of a crankshaft, oleo dampers, and reciprocating cylinder, would pick up some of the random kinetic energy from the bouncing ball and do something useful with it, like turning a drive shaft. I was just working out a convection and air pump system for circulating hot air around the ball when Farnsworth came in. He had tucked carefully under his arm a sphere about the size of a basketball, and if he had made it, to my specifications, weighing thirty-five pounds. He had a worried frown on his forehead. It looks good, I said. What's the trouble? There seems to be a slight hitch, he said. I've been testing for conductivity. It seems to be quite low. That's what I'm working on now. It's just a mechanical problem of pumping enough warm air back to the ball. We can do it with no more than 20% efficiency loss. In an engine, that's nothing. Maybe you're right. But this material conducts heat even less than rubber does. The little ball yesterday didn't seem to have any trouble, I said. Naturally not. It had had plenty of time to warm up before I started it, and its mass-surface area relationship was pretty low. The larger you make the sphere, of course, the more mass inside in proportion to the outside area. You're right, but I think we can whip it. We might have to honeycomb the ball and have part of the work the machine does operate a big hot air pump, but we can work it out. All day long I worked with lathe, milling machine and hacksaw. After clamping the new big ball securely to a workbench, Farnsworth pitched in to help me. But we weren't able to finish by nightfall, and Farnsworth turned his spare bedroom over to me for the night. I was too tired to go home, and too tired to sleep soundly, too. Farnsworth lived on the edge of San Francisco, by a big truck bypass, and almost all night I wrestled with the pillow and sheets listening half-consciously to those heavy trucks rumble by, and in my mind always, the little gray ball bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. By daybreak I came abruptly fully awake, with the sound of crashing echoing in my ears, a battering sound that seemed to come from the basement. I grabbed my coat and pants, rushed out of the room, and almost knocked over Farnsworth, who was struggling to get his shoes on out in the hall, and we scrambled down the two flights of stairs together. The place was a chaos, battered and bashed equipment everywhere, and on the floor, overturned against the far wall, the table that the ball had been clamped to. The ball itself was gone. I had not been fully asleep all night, and the sight of that mess and what it meant jolted me immediately awake. Something, probably a heavy truck, had started a tiny oscillation in that ball, and the ball had been heavy enough to start the table bouncing with it, until by dancing that table around the room, it had literally torn the clamp off and shaken itself free. What had happened afterward was obvious, with the ball building up velocity with each successive bounce. But where was the ball now? Suddenly Farnsworth cried out hoarsely, Look! And I followed his outstretched pudgy fingers to where, at one side of the basement, a window had been broken open. A small window, but plenty big enough for something the size of a basketball to crash through it. There was a little weak light coming in from outdoors, and then I saw the ball. It was in Farnsworth's backyard, bouncing a little sluggishly on the grass. The grass would damp it, hold it back, until we could get to it, unless... I took off up the basement steps like a streak. Just beyond the backyard, I had caught a glimpse of something that frightened me. A few yards from where I had seen the ball was the edge of the big six-lane highway, a broad ribbon of smooth, hard concrete. I got through the house to the back porch, rushed out, and was in the backyard just in time to see the ball take its first bounce onto the concrete. I watched it fascinated when it hit. After the soft, energy-absorbing turf, 
The concrete was like a springboard. Immediately the ball flew high in the air. I was running across the yard toward it, praying under my breath, fall on that grass next time. It hit before I got to it, and right on the concrete again, and this time I saw it go straight up at least fifty feet. My mind was suddenly full of thoughts of dragging mattresses from the house, or making a net or something to stop the hurtling thirty-five pounds, but I stood there as I was, unable to move, and saw it come down again on the highway. It went up a hundred feet, and down again on the concrete, about fifteen feet further down the road, in the direction of the city. That time it was two hundred feet, and when it hit again it made a thud that you could have heard for a quarter of a mile. I could practically see it flatten out on the road before it took off upward again, at twice the speed it had hit at. Suddenly, generating an idea, I whirled and ran back to Farnsworth's house. He was standing in the yard now, shivering from the morning air, looking at me like a little, lost, badly scared child. "'Where are your car keys?' I almost shouted at him. "'In my pocket. Come on!' I took him by the arm and half dragged him to the carport. I got the keys from him, started the car, and by mangling about seven traffic laws and three prize rose bushes, managed to get on the highway, facing in the direction that the ball was heading. "'Look,' I said, trying to drive down the road and search for the ball at the same time. "'It's risky, but if I can get the car under it and we can hop out in time, it should crash through the roof. That ought to slow it down enough for us to nab it. But what about my car? Farnsworth pleaded. What about the first building or the first person it hits in San Francisco? Oh, he said. Hadn't thought of that. I slowed the car and stuck my head out the window. It was lighter now, but no sign of the ball. If it happens to get to town, any town for that matter, it'll be falling from ten or twenty miles, or forty. Maybe it'll go high enough first so that it'll burn like a meteor. No chance, I said. Built-in cooling system, remember? Farnsworth formed his mouth into an O, and at that exact moment there was a resounding thump, and I saw the ball hit in a field, maybe twenty yards from the edge of the road, and take off again. This time it didn't seem to double its velocity, and I figured the ground was soft enough to hold it back. But it wasn't slowing down either not with a bounce factor of better than two to one. Without watching for it to go up, I drove as quickly as I could off the road and over, carrying part of a wire fence with me, to where it had hit. There was no mistaking it. There was a depression about three feet deep, like a small crater. I jumped out of the car and stared up. It took me a few seconds to spot it over my head one side caught by the pale and slanting morning sunlight it was only a bright diminishing speck the car motor was running and i waited until the ball disappeared for a moment and then reappeared i watched for another couple of seconds until i felt i could make a decent guess on its direction hollered at farnsworth to get out of the car it had just occurred to me that there was no use risking his life too dove in and drove a hundred yards or so to the spot I had anticipated. I stuck my head out the window and up. The ball was the size of an egg now. I adjusted the car's position, jumped out, and ran for my life. It hit instantly afterward, about sixty feet from the car, and at the same time it occurred to me that what I was trying to do was completely impossible. Better to hope that the ball hit a pond or bounced out to sea or landed in a sand dune. All we could do was follow, and if it ever damped down enough, grab it. It had hit soft ground and didn't double its height that time, but it had still gone higher. It was out of sight for almost a lifelong minute. And then, incredibly rotten luck, it came down with an ear-shattering thwack on the concrete highway again. I had seen it hit and instantly afterward I saw a crack as wide as a finger open along the entire width of the road. The ball had flown back up like a rocket. My God, I was thinking, now it means business. And on the next bounce, it seemed like an incredibly long time that we craned our necks, Farnsworth and I, 
watching for it to reappear in the sky. And when it finally did, we hardly followed it. It whistled like a bomb, and we saw a gray streak come plummeting to earth almost a quarter of a mile away from where we were standing. But we didn't see it go back up again. For a moment we stared at each other silently. Then Farnsworth almost whispered, Perhaps it's landed in a pond. Or on the world's biggest cow pile, I said. Come on. We could have met our deaths by rock salt and buckshot that night, if the farmer who owned the field had been home. We tore up everything we came to getting across it, including cabbages and rhubarb. But we had to search for ten minutes, and even then we didn't find the ball. What we found was a hole in the ground that could have been a small-scale meteor crater. It was a good twenty feet deep, but at the bottom, no ball. I started wildly at it for a full minute before I focused my eyes enough to see at the bottom a thousand little gray fragments and immediately it came to both of us at the same time a poor conductor the ball had used up all its available heat on the final impact like a golf ball that had been dipped in liquid air and dropped it had smashed into thin slivers the hole had sloping sides and i scrambled down in it and picked up one of the pieces using my handkerchief folded there was no telling how cold it would be it was the stuff, all right, and colder than an icicle. I climbed out. Let's go home, I said. Farnsworth looked at me thoughtfully. Then he sort of cocked his head to one side and asked, What do you suppose will happen when those pieces thaw? I stared at it. I began to think of a thousand tiny slivers whizzing around erratically, ricocheting off buildings in downtown San Francisco and in twenty counties, and no matter what they hit, moving and accelerating as long as there were any heat in the air to give them energy. And then I saw the tool shed on the other side of the pasture from us. But Farnsworth was ahead of me, waddling along, puffing. He got the shovels out and handed one to me. We didn't say a word, neither of us, for hours. It takes a long time to fill a hole twenty feet deep, especially when you're shoveling very, very carefully and packing the dirt very, very hard. End of The Big Bounce by Walter S. Tevis The Celestial Hammerlock by Donald Colvin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. This big time space promoter could get the horsehead nebula in a flying mare, but pinning a planetoid is tougher. The Celestial Hammerlock by Donald Colvin. Spacegram from Jed Michaels, Rytuk Eris, to H. E. Horrocks, Interplanetary Amusement Corp., Cosmopolis Earth. I quit, you balloon brain. Jed. Rocket Mail, Second Class. Dear Michaels, Your last message indicates you wish to leave the employment of the Interplanetary Amusement Corp. Under our employee policy, this is allowable, effective upon completion of your current assignment. Under precedent set as long ago as 2347 A.D., the company will even pay the cost of your message of resignation. However, the words you balloon brain, do not seem a necessary part of the message, and will be deducted from your salary. Furthermore, I have a few words of my own to say. You march straight into my office, Michaels, just as soon as you get back from Eros. Eros? What the hell are you doing on Eros? Horrocks. Rocket Mail, First Class. Mr. H. E. Horrocks. Dear Balloon Brain, if you paid a little more attention to your office and less to the golf course on Venus, you'd know what I'm doing on Eros. I got here two days ago via Mars, with a herd of six wrestlers, in accordance with your own written memorandum. We were to appear at an Aurex club smoker. Upon arrival, I found that no preparations had been made for us, and nobody knows anything about the Aurex club. People here are nuts. They talk in six-syllable words. 
and their idea of a good time is to sniff flowers and do five-dimensional calculus. They have less use for wrestlers than I have for you. Michaels. Rocket mail, second class. Michaels, you nitwit. That wasn't Eros, you idiot. You were supposed to go to Erie. Erie, Pennsylvania, right here on Earth. If you remember even your sixth grade solar system history, you would know that the planetoid Eros was settled in 2141 by a group of longhairs headed by Professor M. R. Snock, a philosopher with a dozen university degrees. He wanted to show that war, crime, and all forms of violence would disappear if people thought only beautiful thoughts. The planetoid is lousy rich with iridinum ore, and people keep in luxury selling it to space freighters. They spend their time being gentle and thinking beautiful. There hasn't even been a spitball thrown there in eight generations. A fine time for you to show up, malahooting six wrestlers with no foreheads. You're lucky they haven't thrown you in jail. Horrocks. Rocket mail. Postage due. Mr. H. E. Horrocks. Dear Jellyhead. What do you mean lucky? We are in jail. Right after we got here, the boys decided they had been cramped in that local spaceship and needed a workout to limber up. As soon as they got started, they were surrounded by a bunch of scrawny males, all sniffing hollyhocks. Their spokesman, a bald bird with rosebuds in his whiskers, touched me with a gold-headed cane and said that apparently we were not yet attuned to the high mental plane of the planetoid, and would we mind going into protective custody? while they worked over our egos and cured our kineticism. I said, suppose we wouldn't. He looked shocked and waved his flower, and said that then, although it had never happened before, he supposed he would have to call the space patrol and have us thrown into the Huskow on Ganymede. I translated that into basic wrestler for the boys, and we agreed we'd better go along. We'd heard about the jail those tough space patrol babies operate on Ganymede, the flower lovers took us to an old iridium pit and asked us to please go down. Now they're perfuming us every hour and feeding us flower bulbs to make us gentle. We could climb out of this rat hole whenever we wanted, but that would be climbing straight into a striped spacesuit. I think about you all the time. If you think they're beautiful thoughts, you're as crazy as I've always suspected. Michaels. P.S. The boys ask that I enclose this note from them. Dear Mr. Horrocks, We do not like it here, Mr. Horrocks. The grub is no good. You come get us. Please, Mr. Horrocks, come soon. Gorilla Man Thorpe, Choker Jonas, R.Z. Zabich, Light Heavyweight Champion of the Moon, Mercury, and the Inner Rings of Saturn, Gorgeous Gordon, Barefoot Charles Enya, X, the Faceless Wonder, Rocket Mail, First Class, Mr. Jed Michaels, Mr. Michaels, don't think you can sit around doing nothing and collect pay from the Interplanetary Amusement Corporation. You're suspended until you get out of there. Horrocks. Spacegram, Collect, Mr. H. E. Horrocks, Cosmopolis Earth. My resignation was a mistake. I withdraw it. You are the best of all possible bosses. Improbable as it seems, I love you. Jed. Spacegram. Mr. Jed Michaels, Rytux Eros. Only one possible cause for your last spacegram. Has she a sister? Hank. Rocket Mail, Second Class. Mr. H. E. Horrocks. My dear employer and pal. Eros is a wonderful asteroid. Toward the end of the second day in the pit, the wrestlers limbered up. Zabich and the Gorilla Man worked out on headlocks. Gorgeous Gordon did calisthenics, and Barefoot Charlie, Choker Jonas, and the Faceless Wonder got themselves into a grunting free-for-all. After that got underway, I heard a squeal, and a girl came bounding down the pit's side. She was young and dark-haired and pretty. She might have been as intellectual as the president of Harvard above the shoulders, but what a framework she had to hold up that brain. She went over to Gorgeous Gordon, and she said, Ooh, 
With all the flower lovers around here, it was probably the first man with muscles she had ever seen. The big ham swelled up. He flexed his arms and stuck out his chest. Ooh, said the girl, and went bounding back up the side of the pit. I stopped the exercise, and the wrestlers sat and mused blankly at each other. In a few minutes our little visitor was back again. With her were about a dozen pals, differing in details, but resembling her in the important points. The leader was a tall, brown-haired, gray-eyed girl with a face where intelligence fought a losing battle with a dimple. The others helped her down the pit side as if she were something fragile and precious, like maybe a new bottle of perfume. Then our pals went back to gorgeous Gordon. More, ooh, said the girl guide. You know how wrestlers are. They'll slap each other silly to get the cheers of four kids on a street corner, or commit mayhem for a purse big enough to buy a ham hock. In five seconds we had going on one of the finest wrestling matches in the history of good, clean sportsmanship. And over the cracking of wrestler's bones rose the shrieks of the girls, showing that their throats were in the right place, even if their brains weren't. The gray-eyed girl sat with me on a flange of unmined ore. She was Aliana, a direct descendant of the leaders of the Eros pioneers. As such, she was a princess of the planetoid although she left most of the governing to the Council of Elders, apparently as outstanding an array of mossbacks as ever smelled a gardenia or just plain smelled. I sometimes think, Mr. Michaels, Aliana told me, that we on Eros have laid too much stress upon the cerebral. I wonder if our lives might not be fuller if we also included some of the more vigorous activities, such as the one in which those men are now engaged. If it's a vacation from your mind you want, Princess, I agreed. Those boys are your meat. Just then the gorilla man got a leg split on barefoot Charlie and began to braid his toes. How stimulating, breathed Aliana. What is proper for an onlooker to remark in such a situation? A satisfactory outcry, Princess, I explained, is, Break it off! Break it off, encouraged Aliana. I had to wind it up finally before the wrestlers reduced themselves to blubber, thereby forcing the Interplanetary Amusement Corporation to go out and lasso itself another herd. The girls were giggling up the side of the pit. At the top, Aliana waved at me. The others blew kisses, not caring much how they landed, as long as the receiver had muscles. The next day, a young man came to the pit. He announced that, upon Princess Aliana's orders, we were to have the freedom of Eros, so that contact with the planetoid culture could win us from our uncouth ways. He was too young to be wholly gentled by the flowers and the Council of Elders. So the choker showed him a wrist lock, and then the choker tossed him on his ear in the iridium ore. He said words that were not beautiful. Maybe there's something to the people of this asteroid. Anyway, everything is great now. We wander wherever we please, as long as we return to the pit to sleep. When nobody is looking, we sneak into the royal palace courtyard and put on a wrestling show for the girls. And the knights. Ah, the knights. Don't turn entirely green with envy, Hankus. At least leave your nose the familiar red. Jed. Spacegram. To Jed Michaels, Rytuk, Eris. Fine work. Return immediately. We'll meet you at Mars. Maybe you can persuade some of the girls to accompany you that far. Am sending the wrestlers to Saturn. Hank. Rocket Mail, First Class. To H. E. Horrocks, Cosmopolis Earth. Dear Hank. Go to Mars, the man says. I can't go anywhere. The elders caught us giving a wrestle when Aliana was away, and we're in again. These flower roots taste terrible. Jed. Spacegram, to Jed Michaels, Rytuk, Eris. You blundering baboon, you're fired. Horrocks. Rocket Mail, Free Royal Frank, Royal Palace, Eros. To H.E. Horrocks, Cosmopolis, Earth. Dear Melonbrain, I gather from your last message that you wish to discharge me. 
I accept the offer, fat boy. In fact, under Royal Eros precedent, which I made up three minutes ago, we will even pay for your message. However, the words, you blundering baboon, do not seem a necessary part of that message, and their cost will be taken out of the first bit of business that the Royal House of Eros decides to honor your puny little corporation with, if any. Times have changed, Hankus. I'm a big shot now. A few hours after we got back in the pit, Aliana came back and sneaked down to see us. She said she thought it was about time to end this Council of Elders nonsense, and asked our help. I told her plan to the wrestlers, with words of one syllable or less. They all agreed, except the faceless wonder. I don't see why I should have nothing to do with no book, he said. It seems he had had a book once and chewed up the first three chapters before he found it wasn't something to eat. I signaled the boys. The bitch clamped a headlock on him. The choker got a hammerlock. The gorilla man took him in the scissors. Gorgeous Gordon got a toehold, and barefoot Charlie stood up and jumped on his stomach. Do you understand now? I asked politely. Sure, Jed, sure, said the faceless wonder. Why didn't you explain it to me in the first place? So the next morning we yelled for books, and the following days, whenever anybody was around, we were busy sniffing flowers and reading. Between times, I tried to explain to the wrestlers why there weren't more pictures in the books. A week later we sprang the trap. I told the stable hand who brought us our fodder that I had taken in so much culture that I was breathing beauty. Zibich gagged a little and asked for a second helping of flower roots. Gorgeous Gordon requested a needle and thread. He said he had fallen behind in his needlepoint. The report of the conversation had got to the Council of Elders, and it brought them to the lip of the pit, looking like something the glue factory had refused to accept. Aliana was with them. I bowed at the waist and made a speech. I thanked the elders for showing me the error of my ways. I said that, after staying in the lovely iridium pit, I was enraptured with flowers, crazy about culture, and practically engaged in fifth-dimensional calculus. I asked that I and the boys could have the priceless boon of walking freely around Eros, swapping beautiful thoughts with the local yokels. The elders went into a deep state of flutter. Most of them were accepting our proposition out of hand, which was bad. Our old pal with the beard saved us. But I saw these men romping, he shrilled. He lowered his voice to a high alto. Positively romping. Perhaps these men could prove their sincerity, Aliana said, winking at me. Perhaps one of them could consent to illustrate what he has learned here by giving a public talk on some scientific subject. I should be glad, I answered, to hack off a lecture for the good folks of Eros. Suppose I give it on anatomy. And so it was decided exactly as we had planned. There was an amphitheater which the inhabitants of Eros had been using for ballets, string quartets, and lectures by such of the long hairs as got stuffed so full of long words that they couldn't keep them to themselves. I had ring posts and ropes set up on the platform, saying I needed them to illustrate my talk. I got into the ring with Gorgeous Gordon and Zbitch, who were dressed in trunks and bathrobes. The wit and beauty of Eros was assembled there, the beauty being represented by the girls, and the wit, such as it was, by the Council of Elders. The rest of the seats were filled by other forms, some of them tolerably easy to look at. I had picked out the subject of anatomy in the belief that none of the inhabitants of Eros knew anything about it. The men didn't notice, and the women had nothing to look at anyway. I went into my act. Kind hosts, friends, and unfortunate incidents, I said. My topic is the science of anatomy. Now the science of anatomy is copacetic to the point of mopery. The cerebellum is distended, and the duodenum goes into a state of e pluribus unum. Uncalculable thrombosis registers, and the ectoplasm become elliptic. Or in the vernacular, the eight ball in the side pocket. The crowd sat stunned. Here and there a flower-sniffer looked down at his own rack of bones to check my statement. 
Let me illustrate, I said. I drew the bathrobes off the wrestlers. The boys' muscles rippled as they strutted around the ring. From the women's spectator came a long, deep sigh. From that moment we had half the audience with us, the female half. In anatomy, I said, shaking my finger to emphasize the point, the wingback shifts outward from a lateral. In the words of the great philosopher Hippocrates, the coil should always be kept clean between the barrel and the tap, and all excess collar should be removed from the spatula. Nobody was listening to me. They were looking at the wrestlers, which, of course, was what I figured on. Most of the men were comparing the grunter's muscles to their own, and here and there a few were dropping their flowers onto the floor. I signaled, and in a second the boys were an omelet of flying legs. The crowd gasped, then leaned forward intently. The shrieking began when Gordon got a headlock on Zbich. It grew when Zbich flipped Gorgeous with a flying mare. By the time Gordon got in a billy goat butt, the amphitheater sounded like feeding time at the zoo. There was another sound, too. Old Whiskers was trotting down the aisle, shrieking, This is romping! Mere romping! I signaled, and the boys stopped. We need a third man to illustrate the next point, I said. Perhaps the gentleman in the aisle will volunteer. Two wrestlers grabbed old Whiskers and tossed him into the ring. Making fast double talk, I took off his shirt, and he stood there, stripped to the waist, blinking in the sun, and looking like a dehydrated squab. The crowd noted the contrast between his scrawniness and the muscles of the wrestlers. A roar of laughter swept in. Perhaps, I said, the gentleman would like to rump. Zubich made a grab for him, and he scuttled out of the ring, falling over the lower rope. A woman in the first row slugged him with a gardenia. Sit down, you old fool, she turned to the wrestlers. Break it off, she shouted. The match went on. In my career, including my medicine show days, I've had lots of easy marks, but nothing to compare with the crowded Eros' first wrestling match. When Gorgeous took the first fall with the body scissors, they went mad. When Zbich evened it up, they went hysterical. When Zbich took the deciding fall, they were delirious. And at the end of the match between Choker Jonas and the Faceless Wonder, they were reduced to jelly. We had to call off the third match for fear we would have to take them home in jars. At the end, we went in a body, led by the wrestlers, and threw the Council of Elders into the Uridium Pit. We are keeping them now on a diet of raw meat. The amphitheater has been converted into a permanent wrestling arena. We've laid out a football and a baseball field in the Lyceum Grove, and next week we'll start turning the botanical garden into a golf course. To carry out the full program, we shall have to buy some equipment and hire some talent. Whether we toss some of the business to interplanetary depends, Hankus boy, entirely on the attitude interplanetary takes toward you-know-who. When you write your crawling letter, you worm, address me as Your Mightiness. I am the Minister of Athletics on Eros now, and the second most important person on the planetoid. My work takes me close to Princess Aliana. Very close. Come to think of it, I wish there was a moon on Eros. It's not essential, but it helps. So long, peasant. End of the Celestial Hammerlock by Donald Colvin Day of the Dog by Anderson Horn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Horowitz Day of the Dog by Anderson Horn They came home from a strange journey, and heroes they might have been, a little dog and a man. Carol stared glumly at the ship-to-shore transmitter. I hate being out here in the middle of the Caribbean with no radio communication, can't you fix it? This is a year for sunspots, and transmission usually gets impossible around dusk. 
Bill explained. It'll be all right in the morning. If you want to listen to the radio, you can use the portable radio directional finder. That always works. I want to catch the five o'clock news and hear the latest on our satellite, Carol replied. She went to the RDF and switched it on to the standard broadcast channel. Anyhow, I'd feel better if we could put out a signal. The way we're limping along with water in our gas is no fun. It'll take us twenty hours to get back to Nassau the way we're losing RPMs. Bill Anderson looked at his young, pretty wife and smiled. You're behaving like a tenderfoot. We've plenty of gas, a good boat, and perfect weather. Tomorrow morning I'll clean out our carburetors and we'll pick up speed. Meantime, we're about to enter one of the prettiest harbors in the Bahamas. Throw over anchor. The RDF drowned him out. The world is anxiously awaiting return of the chamber from the world's first manned satellite launched by the United States ten days ago. The world also awaits the answers to two questions. Is there any chance that Robert Joy, the volunteer scientist who went up in the satellite, is still living? There seems to be little hope for his survival, since radio communication from him stopped three days ago. Timing mechanism for the ejection of Joy are set for tonight. And that's the second question. Will the satellite, still in its orbit, eject the chamber containing Joy? Will it eject the chamber as scheduled? And will the chamber arrive back at Earth at the designated place? There are many ifs to this project which is shrouded in secrecy. The president himself has assured us of a free flow of news once the chamber has been recovered, and this station will be standing by to bring you a full report. Carol switched the radio off. Do you think he's alive? She suppressed a shudder. God, think of a human being up there in that thing. Well, the dog lived for several days. It was just a question of getting it back, which the Russians couldn't do. I don't know about Joy. He sounded real cheerful and healthy until his broadcast stopped. Bill peered into the fading twilight. Come on now, let's put our minds to getting the hook over. They concentrated on the tricky entrance to the lee side of Little Harbor K. It meant finding and passing a treacherous coral head north of the adjoining frozen K. Little Harbor K was midway in the chain of the Berry Islands, which stretched to the north like beads in a necklace. There's the cove, called Carol. About a mile of coastline ahead was the small native settlement. Once the center of a thriving sponge industry, the island was now practically deserted. A handful of small cottages, a pile of conch shells on the beach, and two fishing smacks gave evidence of a remaining, though sparse, population. Dusk was rapidly approaching, and Carol strained her eyes against the falling light. Bill heard her call his name and saw her pointing, not ahead to their anchorage, but amidships and towards the sky. He turned his eyes to where she was indicating and saw a dullish object in the sky some thousand feet up. The object seemed to be falling leisurely towards Earth. "'What in the world is that?' asked Bill. "'It's not a bird, that's for sure.' The object seemed to be parachuting, not falling. The breezes were blowing it towards the island. Before they could study it further, it was lost in the lowering dusk and darkness of the shoreline. "'Looks like a ball on a parachute.' Bill finally said. However, the business at hand was to make secure the seven seas, and together they spent the next quarter hour anchoring. After setting the hook securely, Carol and Bill donned swimsuits, dove overboard, and swam lazily the three hundred yards into shore. Let's try to find that thing we saw. It shouldn't be too far from here, said Carol the moment they hit the beach. They climbed inland on the rocky island. Little green lizards scooted underfoot, and vines scratched at their ankles. Bill was leading, when suddenly he called, Carol, I see something up ahead. There's something lying on the ground. He hurried toward what he had seen. The dying sun reflected on a luminescent bolt of cloth, somewhat like a spun aluminum fabric. Thin wire lines were entangling it, and about ten feet away lay three fragments of what appeared to have been a dull metal box. Carol knelt at the closest piece, evidently a corner of the box. It was lined with wiring and tubes. It looks like electronic equipment, decided Carol, peering intently at the strange piece. Bill had approached the second and largest fragment. He carefully turned it over. It was filled with black and yellow... fur? Oh, no, he cried, knowing in a flash, yet denying it in his mind at the same time. Stunned, he stared at the perky ears, the dull staring and unseeing eyes, the leather thongs that held the head and body of a dog to the metal encasement. 
Carol saw it the next instant. "'It's some horrible joke,' she gasped. "'It couldn't be the second Russian satellite. "'It couldn't be Mutnik. "'My God, no, it couldn't be!' "'Bill kept staring, his thoughts racing. "'There were rumors of an ejection chamber for Mutnik, "'but they had been denied by the Russians. "'But suppose the Russians had planned an ejection chamber "'for the dog Laika when they launched the satellite "'and had only denied it after they thought it had failed. "'But if it had worked, why had it taken so long to find its way to Earth? "'The satellite itself was supposed to have disintegrated months ago. "'Damn,' thought Bill. "'I wish I were a scientist right now instead of a know-nothing artist.' He touched the dog with his toe. It was perfectly preserved, as though it had died just a few hours before. It was rigid, but it had not started to decompose. Carol, are we crazy? Is this some dream, or do you believe we're looking at the ejection chamber of a Russian satellite? He asked, doubting even what he was saying. I don't know. Carol was wide-eyed. But what shall we do now? We'd better contact the authorities immediately. Bill tried to keep reason from overcoming his disbelief of their discovery. But how, Carol? Our radio transmitter isn't working. It won't till morning. And there's certainly no other way to communicate with anyone. We can't even take the boat anywhere with the speed we're making. We'll have to wait till morning. What shall we do with the dog? asked Carol. Do you think we ought to bury it? Lord, no, Carol. The body of the dog will be extremely valuable to science. We've got to get someone here as quickly as possible. Bill was trying to steady his nerves. "'Let's go back and try to raise someone on the radio. Let's try again. It, it may work,' called Carol, running in the direction of the boat. Bill followed her. They stumbled on the craggy rocks and exposed sea grape roots, but together in the darkness they struck out for the boat. Bill was first aboard and went directly to the ship-to-shore radio. "'Try the Nassau Marine Operator first, Carol panted as she clambered aboard. "'He's a lot closer to us than Miami.' As the receiver warmed up, static filled the cabin. Bill depressed the transmitting button. This is the yacht Seven Seas calling the Nassau Marine Operator, he called into the phone. Only static answered. Bill, Carol said in sudden inspiration, give a mayday. Try every channel with a mayday. If anyone picks up a mayday call, you'll get emergency action. Mayday, mayday, this is the yacht Seven Seas, come in anyone, Bill called urgently into the mouthpiece. He switched to the Coast Guard channel, then to the Miami Marine Operator's channel. Only static filled the cabin. No welcome voice acknowledged their distress call. Bill flipped the switch desperately to the two ship-to-ship -ship channels. Mayday! Come in any boat! Still static. Nothing but static. It was night. A night without a moon. The island loomed dark against the black waters. The dark was relieved only by a small fire burning at the native settlement a half-mile down the coast and the cabin lights of the seven seas. "'What'll we do now?' Carol tried to sound unconcerned, but her voice sounded thin and wavering. "'I don't know what we can do, except wait until daybreak. I'm sure we can get a signal out then,' Bill replied, calmly as he could. He hoped she couldn't hear the pounding of his heart. "'What about the dog?' she asked. "'Will it be all right there? Should we bring it aboard?' And we'd better leave everything untouched. Our best bet is to get some sleep and place our call as soon as day breaks. Neither of them could eat much supper, and after putting the dishes away, they made up their bunks and climbed in. After a very few minutes, Bill handed a lighted cigarette across the narrow chasm between the bunks. I can't sleep. My head is spinning. Do you really believe that's what we found? Carol's voice sounded small. Yes, I do. I believe we've found the Russian ejection unit, complete with the dog Laika and instrumentation. They lay quietly, the glow of two cigarettes occasionally reflecting on the bulkhead. Bill finally arose. I can't think of another thing but what's sitting out there on the little harbor quay. He walked up to the main cabin and switched on the RDF. For a few minutes there was music, and then... Flash! The United States government has just officially released the news that at 10.09 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the U.S. satellite ejection chamber was successfully returned to Earth at the designated location. This was some six hours earlier than expected. 
the chamber into which Robert Joy voluntarily had himself strapped has landed at an undisclosed site and is being raced under heavy guard to the Walter Reed Hospital at Washington, D.C. There is no hope that Joy is still living. Word has just been released by Dr. James R. Killian that instruments measuring Joy's pulse rate indicated three days ago that all Joy's bodily processes ceased to function at that time. We repeat, all hope of the survival of Robert Joy is now abandoned as the result of scientific data just released by Dr. Killian. The satellite is being brought intact to Walter Reed Hospital, and leading physiologists and scientists are racing to the scene to be on hand for the opening of the unit scheduled for 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Further reports will be given as received. This station will remain on the air all night. Stay tuned for further developments. We repeat, the U.S. satellite's ejection chamber, containing the first human being ever to go into space, has been successfully returned to Earth as predicted, though all hope has been abandoned for the survival of Robert Joy, the man in the moon. The chamber will be opened for scientific study tomorrow morning. Stay tuned for further news. Bill tuned down the music that ensued and returned to his bunk. You heard that, Carol? He knew she wasn't asleep. Yes, and it makes this whole thing that we've found seem more plausible. I've been lying here trying to make myself believe it's some sort of dream, but it isn't. If we could only... Carol's voice faded softly into the night. There was absolutely nothing they could do. Nothing but lie there and smoke and pretend to sleep. They didn't talk much, and keenly felt the terrible frustration of their enforced silence on the ship to shore. They heard several more news reports and several analyses of the news, but nothing new was added throughout the night. The radio only reiterated that the ejection unit had been recovered, that hope had faded for Joy's survival, and that the chamber was to be opened in the morning as soon as scientists had convened in Washington. Dawn, long in coming, broke about 4.30. With the lifting of the dark, the sun spots which interfered with radio reception miraculously lifted also. Bill and Carol sat next to the ship to shore and turned it on. This time, they heard the reassuring hum of the transmitter, not drowned out by the awful static of the night before. Bill switched to the Coast Guard channel. Mayday! Mayday! This is the Seven Seas calling the United States Coast Guard. Come in, please. And a voice almost miraculously answered. This is the U.S. Coast Guard. Come in, Seven Seas. What is your position? Come in, Seven Seas. This is the yacht Seven Seas back to the Coast Guard. We're located at the Berry Islands at Little Harbor Cay. We want to report the discovery of what we believe to be the second Russian satellite. This is the Coast Guard to the Seven Seas. Do we read you correctly? Are you reporting discovery of the Russian satellite? Please clarify. Over. A stern voice crackled through the speaker. Last evening on entering the harbor here, we saw an object fall to the ground. On inspection, it was a metal box which was broken apart on impact. In it are electronic equipment and the body of a small dog. Over. Bill tried to be calm and succinct. Coast Guard to Seven Seas. Is your boat in distress? Over. No, no. Did you read me about the Russian satellite? Asked Bill, impatience in his voice. Will you state your name and address? Will you state the master's full name and the call letters and registration of your craft? Over. Crackled the voice from the speaker. Oh, my lord, we're not going to have red tape at a time like this, are we? Carol asked exasperatedly. This is Bill Anderson of Fort Lauderdale, owner and skipper. Our call letters are William George 3176, Coast Guard registration number 235-46-5483. What are your instructions regarding dog satellite? Please stand by. Bill and Carol stared at each other while the voice on the radio was silent. Seven Seas. Seven Seas, standing by. We wish to remind you that it is illegal and punishable by fine and or imprisonment to issue false reports to the Coast Guard. We are investigating your report and wish you to stand by. Investigating a report? Bill fairly shouted into the phone. Good God, man! The thing to investigate is here! Laying in three pieces on the middle of Little Harbor Cay! This is no joke! Despite the emotion in Bill's voice, the answer came back routine and cold. Please stand by. We will call you. Do not, we repeat, do not make further contact anywhere. Please stand by. Coast Guard standing by with the Seven Seas. Seven Seas standing by, shouted Bill, almost apoplectic, his face reddening in anger. 
Now what? It looks like they're going to take their time in believing us. At least until they find out who we are and if we're really here, said Carol. Bill paced the deck in frustration. Suddenly he decided. Carol, you stick with the radio. I'm going ashore again and take another look at our Mutnik. It seems so incredible that I'm not even sure of what I saw last night. Once they believe us, they'll want to know as much about it as we can tell them. Bill hurriedly put on his swimsuit and heard Carol shout as he dove overboard. Hurry back, Bill. I don't like you leaving me here alone. Bill swam with sure, even strokes to the shore where they had gone last night. The water felt cool. It soothed his nerves, which jangled in the excitement of the discovery and in the anger at the disbelieving authorities. He reached shallow water and waded toward shore. Suddenly he stopped dead, his ankles in five inches of water. His eyes stared ahead in disbelief. His brain was numbed. Only his eyes were alive, staring wide in horror. Finally, his brain pieced together the image that his vision sent to it, pieced it together, but made no comprehension of it. His brain told him that there was a blanket of fur laying unevenly twenty feet back from the shoreline, a blanket of yellow and black fur covering the earth, covering mangrove roots, fitted neatly around the bent palm tree trunks, lying over the rocks that had cut his feet last night, smothering, suffocating, hugging the earth. Bill shut his eyes, and still the vision kept shooting to his brain, all yellow and black and fuzzy, with trees or a tall mangrove bush or a sea grapevine sticking up here and there. He opened his eyes and wanted to run, for the scene was still there. It hadn't disappeared as a nightmare disappears when you wake up. Thick yellow and black fur lay on the ground like dirty snow, covering everything low, hugging the base of taller things. Run, his mind told him. Yet he stood rooted to the spot, staring at the carpet of fur near him. It was only ten feet away. Ten feet? His every muscle jumped. The lock that had held his muscles and brain in a tight vice gave loose, and a flood of realization hit him. It's moving, he realized in horror. It's growing! As he watched, slowly, slowly, as the petals of a morning glory unfold before the eye, the yellow and black fur carpet stretched itself in ever-increasing perimeter. He saw it approach a rock near the beach. The mind, when confronted with a huge shock, somehow concentrates itself on a small detail. Perhaps it tries to absorb itself in a small thing because the whole thing is too great to comprehend all at once. So with Bill's mind. He saw the yellow and black fur grow toward the rock. It seemed to ooze around it, and then up and over the top of it. Bill saw, when it reached the top of the rock, that it dropped a spiny tendril to the ground. Like a root, the tendril buried itself into the earth below the jutting rock, and slowly the rock was covered with the flowing fur. Bill's thoughts sped ahead of his reason. The dog. The dog. Growing like a plant. Its hide covering the ground, putting out roots, suffocating everything, smothering everything, growing, growing. With almost superhuman effort, he turned his back on the awful sight and swam desperately out to the seven seas. "'Bill, what happened?' cried Carol, when she saw his white and terrified face. "'Carol, the dog! It must have had some cosmic reaction to its cellular structure, some cancerous reaction. When the chamber broke open and the cells were exposed to our atmosphere again, it started some action, started to grow. It doesn't stop growing. It's horrible!' Bill's words were disjointed and hysterical. Carol stared at him. Bill, what are you saying? Bill pointed mutely to the shore. Carol rushed to the cockpit. She stared at the island. She ran back to the cabin where Bill was sitting, holding his head in his hands. She grabbed the binoculars from the bookshelf and turned them to the island. Bill, it's... Oh, no. The whole island looks as though it's covered with fur. She screamed. Bill grabbed the binoculars and ranged the island with them. A quarter of a mile down, he could see small figures in the water floundering around, climbing aboard the two fishing smacks. All around, the black and yellow mounds of fur carpeted the pretty green island with a soft rug of yellow and black. Get the Coast Guard, Carol. They called back while you were gone. They're sending a plane over immediately. Call them, Carol, Bill shouted to her. Don't you realize what this could mean? 
Don't you realize that something, only God knows what, has happened to the cellular structure of this animal? Has turned it into a voracious plant-like thing that seems to grow and grow once it hits our atmosphere? Don't you realize that today they're going to open that satellite, that other one in Washington? Suppose this is what happens when living tissue is exposed to cosmic rays or whatever is up there. Don't you see what could happen? Bill was hoarse from fright and shouting, Smother everything! Grow and grow and smother! Carol was at the ship to shore. What time is it, Carol? I don't know. Five-thirty, I guess? They plan to open the ejection chamber at six. We've got to tell them what happened here before they open it. Hurry with the damn Coast Guard. Mayday! Mayday! Coast Guard, come in! This is the Seven Seas! Come in and hurry! Coast Guard to the Seven Seas! Come in! Bill grabbed the phone. Listen carefully, he said in a quiet, determined voice. This is God's own truth. I repeat, this is God's own truth. The remains of the dog we discovered last night have started to grow. It's growing as we look at it. It has covered the entire island as far as we can see with fur. Stinking yellow and black fur. We've got to get word to Washington before they open up the satellite. The same thing could happen there. Do you understand? I must get in touch with Washington immediately. There was no mistaking the urgency and near panic in Bill's voice. The Coast Guard returned with, We understand you, Seven Seas. We will clear a line directly to Dr. Killian in Washington. Stand by. With his hand shaking, Bill turned on the standard broadcast band of the portable RDF. A voice cut in. Latest reports from Walter Reed General Hospital, where the first human man satellite ejection chamber has just been opened. All leading physiologists and physicists were assembled at the hospital by midnight last night, and plans to open the ejection chamber at 6 a.m. this morning were moved up. The chamber was opened at 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time today. Our first report confirmed that volunteer moon traveler, the man in the moon, Robert Joy, was no longer alive. Hope had been abandoned for him some 80 hours previous, when recording instruments on his body processes indicated no reactions. Of scientific curiosity is the fact that though dead for more than three days, his body is in a perfect state of preservation. Flash! We interrupt this special newscast for a late bulletin. The body of Robert Joy has begun to shoot out unexplained appendages, like rapidly growing cancerous growths. His integument appears to be enlarging, growing away from his body. Hello, Seven Seas, broke in the ship to shore. We are still trying to locate Dr. Killian. End of Day of the Dog by Anderson Horn Recording by Josh Horowitz, Los Angeles